happy to discuss infinity always. Uh, mm -hmm. Not that I feel like I'm a specialist in that particular mm -hmm. subject, but I just think that the subject is fascinating and it, it kind of occurs in so many different situations from fairly elementary mathematics, if, a, if I may say so, right, to very advanced mathematics and logic and computer science. So it really kind of uh, is everywhere in mathematics, everywhere in applications even of mathematics to other subjects. And it's not an easy topic, I no. think, when you first look at it. Uh, I don't know when you first heard about infinity. Well, I heard about it probably when I was pretty young. I heard, you know, but the idea of infinity, it just it was sort of like the universe, uh, which also isn't as simple a concept I learned later, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but it was just this sense of like, more than everything else, right? And so, so then, you know, when I got to the point where it, in, infinitesimal uh, increments were being used and infinity was being used for calculations, I found that just very, very jarring that, that it could well, be like, it seemed more like this, like magic, like this magic sauce and you pour infinity on it and then everything's infinity. But the fact that it could actually be used practically and theoretically, yeah, it, it, it kind of blew my mind and still does. Well, it is, it is, it is a magical object, subject, right? Um, so I would not try to make it so too simplistic, obviously, right? And as you just said, even in calculus, this is a fairly complicated situation you're dealing with. Well, you're dealing with these limits or something infinitesimally small, typically, right? Uh, is divided by something else, which is also infinitesimally small. Yeah. Who knows what you're going to get yeah. as a result? And um, this is the very beginning of calculus, which is what Newton did and what Leibniz did. And, you know, some mathematicians even prior to them were already thinking about. And this is a very complicated concept, actually, if you think about this. Mm -hmm. and, and it took several centuries for top mathematicians to come to grips with that. So when we go uh, and teach calculus, let's say uh, it's a subject uh, dear to your heart, I understand. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so so when, when you hear this for the first time, and especially when it's done briefly, when it's, done, when it's done like, oh, you know, just take this limit, la la la. Mm. Uh, this is swiping so many uh, developments of math of mathematics sort of under the rug, because this is far from being trivial. This is far from being uh, immediately clear. This is far from being uh, something that you should just get in an instant. And I appreciate when students struggle with that because, you know, it took, as, as, as we just said, you know, it took centuries for really good mathematicians to understand what, the, what it means. So even if you look, if you look at Newton's prin Principia Mathematica, you know nobody reads this in the original these days. You know it's my aspiration to actually read it at some point. My Latin Believe is rusty, unfortunately. <laughs> it's you know it's a huge it's a huge volume, and it's amazing in terms of sophistication that is already there we are talking 17th century uh, work absolutely but look at what what newton does there he talks about um final quantities i think that's the term he uses so he almost thinks of time you know typically he let's say differentiates with respect to time mm -hmm. differentiates various uh functions of time with respect to time to see the rate of change right at some particular moment of time. So that's a typical situation he is interested in as a physicist primarily, right? Mm -hmm. Why was he developing calculus? He was doing that not because he was primarily interested in math, frankly. Mm -hmm. He was primarily interested in solving these physical problems. That was his first uh, goal. And he needed to have them, he needed to develop a mathematical tool or mathematical tools that would allow him to accomplish that. Exactly. Yeah. It was just not ready at the time. So he had to sort of step away and develop all those tools. It's a little bit like Leonardo da Vinci. You know, he started as a painter, as, a, as an artist. And then he 
wanted to really understand aspects of that art. And he, he realized that he had to develop science, uh, various things in science to actually be a better painter, <laughs> which is wow. very interesting. And then he became this amazing scientist, right? And, and then went back and forth between art and, and science. But, you know, I digress. So I like I, you, I like digressions. Okay. <laughs> I live for uh, them. But was uh, it for the was it for the curve? The like was that because that, that that was sort of the the impression that I got is that when when you start dealing with calculating curves rather than mm -hmm. just straight lines and angles that 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 then perhaps calculus has to be brought into play is well very early on right if you want to understand the rate of change of anything mm -hmm. with respect to uh, uh, what we call now a variable, mm -hmm. which is another non-trivial concept. If we go farther back in time, right, then it's probably 15th century, 14th century, this notion that we can um, understand basic calculations in terms of functions, right, this functional point of view, where we say, well, the input is a variable, right, it mm -hmm. changes and in response to that change, the function will change. So basic calculations like raising something to the power two or whatever, you know, power three can be thought of in this function uh, theoretic way. This is already non-trivial, frankly, right? This was the first jump in abstraction uh, mm -hmm. be between this basic algorithmic approach. Okay, let's go and calculate things and now let's think of this whole calculation as an object, right, as a function. This is a non-trivial new novel point of view at, you know, this is sort of renaissance uh, around that time when this point of view even became known. It feels Again. like it. I mean, it feels like it when, you know, just to me, it it's so beautiful the, that as I learned at a very, I mean, it's still a very basic level, but as I learned these concepts or even talking to you about it, you know, the idea of taking, of abstracting from a process that could be really kind of quotidian and then making it something that's like a machine, a function machine. It's Absolutely. just, it's, just a, it, it, it's, it's glorious, it is. Yeah, yeah it's, it's basically taking this recipe, which could be a very simple recipe, right? But thinking of the whole recipe as one object. Mm -hmm. You all look at black box, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, that's a sort of function theoretic point of view. But coming back to Newton, yeah. right? So he already knew this function theoretic point of view very well, obviously, because he was a student of Galileo. He knew all the modern um, uh, developments in physics and mathematics of, of the time. And so he was faced with this problem. Okay, how do we understand? do we understand instantaneous rates of change, right? So you have a quantity which depends on another quantity. Think of the first being um, variable, right? Mm -hmm. It being a variable, what we call now, and the second responding to the change in the first one, right? And now we have some mo magic moment in time and we wanna understand at that specific moment, how fast does this, you know, function quantity change in response to the, uh, the, you know, sort of basic straightforward change in the original variable. So this is all highly, highly non-trivial. And then he takes what he said, what he calls final quantities, which is very interesting. So when you read uh, what he writes, it's as if he was dealing with you know, it almost sounds like he is dealing with discrete time. Mm. <laughs> he almost says there is this finite quantity, this infinitesimal delta T or delta X, right? Mm. Which is as small as it can get. So you kind of do not go be below a certain tiny quantity, which is the final delta T. That's all, you know, that's almost what he says on the page. So it's sort of like, if, if, as I'm, I'm uh, under, understand what you're saying, it's, it's like sort of making it at, at time as granular as possible. Uh, exactly. That, that like in a sense, well, here is the, so to speak, smallest unit of time. Like this right. is one unit of time. When you move forward in time, this is the least you can move forward. Right. 
Yeah. He is essentially talking uh, about something which sounds to us, you know, to a modern reader, um, as if he were talking about discrete units of time. Exactly. Yeah. So there is this absolutely smallest unit of time. Let's use that, right? Uh, and this goes in, into the denominator. On top, you have the infinitesimal smallest change in the function, right? And let's let's take the ratio of those two and see what happens. So basically, that's what he is saying. Um, so it begs the question how Newton even thought about time or about units of space, maybe. Maybe he also thought that space had this kind of infinitesimally small um, indivisible units. Mm -hmm. um, and one also gets the sense that maybe he kind of left it open deliberately saying, look, we don't know, uh, or maybe we don't even need to know as as far as we can make sense of this quantities mm -hmm. and that's what he is doing and obviously you know he just look at look at his stuff it's it's incredibly sophisticated so i remember when i i once taught um history of mathematics mm -hmm. and um i always show source materials there you know the original uh pages Fortunately, we can go, you know, several centuries back. It's much harder to go 2,000 years back, 3,000 years back. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. even, though, even though we do have some mm -hmm. historical records, obviously, right? But it's just harder. But several centuries back is not such a big problem. And so you can see what Newton actually did in the original, uh, say, edition of his, of his book. And he does amazing stuff. So there was one calculation that sort of didn't make sense. He was sort of computing derivatives, but in a very weird way. And it was all written in shorthand. It's a little bit like, you know, when you see Bach's uh, writings. So he mm. doesn't, Bach doesn't write all the notes. Yeah. It's not written in detail. It's written sort of in code because he has, has done so much of that. He could just mm. kind of write for himself in terms of this code. And so likewise, you know, Newton kind of writes in code mm -hmm. and there is a cryptic table uh, where it's some coefficients are being computed. And at the end, he kind of adds them together in a weird fashion and he gets the right result. And uh, a colleague of mine brought it to me and said, basically, huh? <laughs> and, <laughs> and we both looked and, um, you know, it didn't make any immediate sense initially it didn't so, make sense how he got to that exactly he gets the right answer it's entirely unclear offhand right offhand it's unclear what on earth he's doing <laughs> how he gets the answer um so we were wondering for a while and then um several days later this colleague of mine comes back and says i figured that out this is amazing <laughs> <laughs> so he actually um, kind of reinterprets the function. It's a univariate function initially. So he kind of introduces a second variable, an artificial second variable. He homogenizes the function, basically. So basically kind of makes it a projective uh, uh, geometry question instead of the original you know, univariate geometry question. Anyway, he introduces a second variable. He makes it into a bivariate function. He, he performs partial differentiation with respect to these two variables in a very clever way after dividing by some extra stuff. And then, yes, and then he adds them up cleverly to get back to the original univariate case. And did so, he do that just this was in his mind? Like he didn't, he didn't note it? He didn't write he didn't it down? Even, he didn't even write it down. I think he was very comfortable understanding what he's doing but wow. he didn't even bother to explain this because that was a calculation kind of done probably for himself mm -hmm. and it does look cryptic the first time you come across uh, something like that you go like what just happened right what does this even mean and this is still a fairly basic problem but i'm just saying um you know you look at masters of uh, the craft like newton or euler or, or Gauss, and you look at their, uh, you know, pages and pages that they 
they, they uh, produced. And some of this is in sort of polished form and some of them is in manuscript form and some of them maybe are even diary pages, you know, things like that, different, different levels of uh, presentation. But because they were so comfortable with uh, so many things they've done before, mm -hmm. because they were doing uh, mathematics every day, literally for hours and hours, they could use the shorthand for themselves. So oftentimes, you it's, 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 it's a bit like a very accomplished musician who is kind of just improvising, mm -hmm. who's kind of ripping. Um, and you go like, wow, because behind all of this improvisation, there are hours and hours and hours of practice, obviously. Right. Yeah. So you cannot get there without, and it's not just 10,000 hours, you know, this famous kind of yeah, yeah. number, uh, typically for Newton or, or Euler or Leibniz or Gauss, all these guys. I mean, this, this was way in excess of 10,000 hours. Uh -huh. So that's why it's so awe inspiring because you see masters at work. So when you actually read the original, if you can, I always recommend to my students, obviously it's incredibly time consuming mm -hmm. to go back and read Euler, right? You know, mm -hmm. who is gonna do this? Very few people will do this, let me tell you this. Especially because it's written in Latin, typically. Um, I think Gauss was the last one who wrote in Latin. And from that point on, uh, people became more comfortable writing in their vernacular languages shall mm -hmm. we say yeah, yeah. French, French and German and later Russian and so mm -hmm. forth um, but you know about uh, yeah until the early 19th century I would say mathematics was still written in Latin at least officially which is very interesting and so if you go read this Latin uh, um, articles and books it's quite fascinating uh, but i highly recommend all is you know just read euler it's it's incredible what's it, there it seems it, so you're saying that i as, as you know old guy i i didn't quite make it through calculus and in, in college <laughs> but, you think, but you're saying if i picked up a trend and i i don't uh read latin or german but if, if i picked up a, tr a good translation of euler you're saying that i could like read it that I could actually get a bunch of stuff out of it. I would think so. Obviously, right, there are different levels of difficulty there. Yeah. But there is some amazing stuff. And again, what maybe modern um, students of mathematics do not fully know or recognize is it wasn't all rigorous, frankly, right? Mm -hmm. So when we are taught mathematics, you know, higher mathematics, whatever that means for the first time. It's all kind of dry, cut and dry, right? Um, you know, epsilon delta, yeah. theorem, theorem proof, corollary, la la la, right? We keep yeah. going. And that's not how mathematics was done historically. Mathematics uh, had various gaps in it, various uh, potential problems in it. Um, so this whole rigorization of calculus was a big headache, frankly, right? For, for many, many decades, if not centuries. Centuries, I think, is accurate. So um, if you go and look at the time between Newton, Newton and Leibniz first setting forth the foundations of calculus, right? And continue through the next century and, and beyond, in way into mid 19th century or maybe even the end of 19th century when it was all made rigorous finally okay we're talking 19th century uh, chronicler so koshi made a lot of effort but you know this was not maybe fully completed at that time at that point of time so we should look at chronicler and Weierstrass, who completed that program so okay? you when you it's late 19th century yeah, yeah. So when you're saying rigorous, you mean like then like here's step by step. There's no there are no leaps when when it's rigorous. Here's this is proved before the next thing is proved. Rather, is that the the rigor uh, that you're talking about? That's that's what I mean. But yeah. more importantly, what I mean, even the basic notions were not settled mm -hmm. way into the 19th century. So Cauchy was 
the mathematician responsible for the first uh, clear definition of a limit. <laughs> so we should appreciate that. It's incredible, right? Uh, people worked with limits. People wa worked with derivatives, starting with Newton. If mm -hmm. not before, there were some pre-Newtonian work as well, uh, you know, different works of different people, um, kind of precursor, precursors of calculus. But let's say with Newton. So between Newton and Cauchy, many mathematicians could differentiate functions. They could take limits of functions. They could take limits of sequences and so forth. Uh, but that was not done in a rigorous way. There was not even a rigorous notion of a limit. So this, mm -hmm. this small epsilon delta thingy that mm -hmm. we learn and we teach then later mm -hmm. on in calculus, gosh, this is actually so non-trivial. It's such a misleadingly simple definition. We can appreciate its simplicity now, but you know it took centuries to get there. And again, it's far from being easy. It, yeah. it is simple, you know, it's simple now, but it was not straightforward at all how to formulate the notion of a limit even in the first place. I, I really wish, Olga, that that somehow I could have done a time machine. I could have had you rather than the teaching assistant that I had in calculus, because he, he in fact used the term frequently that something was trivial and obvious. And he would be referring to like introducing limits or uh, integration. And, you know, it wasn't, not only was it not trivial or obvious to me, I was like, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't. And so the way you're describing it now, which is this, this sort of procession of, of intellectual leaps from different angles, but but not in the same way as in, I think my textbook was called Thomas and like the Thomas textbook just went, you know, it said, it was as if everything had just gone rigorously from the beginning. And, oh. and it doesn't, it didn't, it didn't feel right. And, and you're saying it, it actually didn't happen that way. That was, that was done after the fact. It absolutely did not happen that way. Mm -hmm. It very rarely happens that mm -hmm. way in science generally, mm -hmm. as, as you probably know. Um, so mathematics is not unique in that way. Mathematics is a living, breathing branch of science. And when you see it on the page, especially in introductory textbooks in college at the university, um, it's all cut and dry. It's all set in stone. It's all like, wow, you know, it's all done. It's finished, right? It feels final. It was brought down in, in tablets from the mountain to, exactly, make, a exactly. to make a comparison yeah. to another. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you don't, as you know, as Erdish said, you don't have to believe in God, but you have to believe in the book. So he had this notion, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, about Erdish, right? And I, I don't know. This is new to me. Oh, wow. Okay. So Erdish, I mean, this is a, a subject matter for an infinite amount of time. Erdős was a very special mathematician, you know, sort of a mathematician's mathematician. And um, he was incredibly prolific. He leave, lived and breathed mathematics. Literally, he was 100% devoted to mathematics. Only mathematics existed in his life, mm -hmm. wow. which is amazing. You know, it's, it's an amazing level of dedication. Mm -hmm which I think we can admire, but not all of us have, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So he had this very interesting mythology. It was maybe not exactly serious, but he would, he would say things like, um, there is a, the book, you know, of mm. perfect proofs. So most proofs obviously do not live up to that level. But at some point, if you're very lucky, you know, sort of heaven opens to you and you see the perfect proof, the proof mm -hmm. on the book. And so mm -hmm. he used to joke that you know, when a mathematician passes away, he or she, you know, finally gets access to the book. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a, a lovely, very hopeful view of the afterlife. Uh, exactly, exactly. And again, you know, you don't have to believe in that, but it's kind of nice to maybe believe in that there is a, an ideal proof somewhere out there. 
it's this platonic ideal, obviously, right? One of those platonic ideals. Or maybe out there, there is a perfect proof for every mathematical statement you can make and, uh, and prove. But it also is, is, it's, I find it very hopeful and exciting the way you describe it, that this idea of perfection it can be something that uh, that's aspirational, <laughs> you know, that, and, and that, and that the things that happen, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not articulating this well, because my mind I, I, is just sort of working on it, but it, but it, it's, it's sort of this idea that my idea of math, when I hit especially math in college and calculus and stuff like that was that everything was actually perfectly worked out and perfect in, in every way. And, you know, there was a right and there was a wrong. And, um, and this idea of gradations of improvements and even of successes that aren't perfect, right, is, is I don't know, I, I find a very, a very comforting one. And it makes sense too, because I guess I, and generally speaking, as I very vaguely know in science, you know, you make, you make advances, you make advances, but. Exactly. You, yeah. It's not the yeah. end. You haven't actually reached the end of science or the end of mathematics. That's right. And so often in mathematics, like in physics, people could understand, could come up with the right answer without maybe fully understanding how they got there. Yeah. Or having all, you know, a fully rigorous justification uh, for their method of getting there. Mm -hmm. And this is much more common in physics. You talk about string theory, which is not fully rigorized even now. You talk about other theories um, of um, gravitation and matter and so forth. And then there is this very vigorous debate as to how to even understand the foundations, which is perfectly fine, right? It doesn't mean that uh, this branch of science is somehow in the wrong or doomed or you know something is is uh, fatally problematic with it it just means it's still in in progress right uh these things are still being figured out and that's perfectly healthy and that's how we make progress it sort of feels like in in terms of the the, the way of thinking like the opposite of ideology the opposite of the sense that we're we're now going to say whatever whatever subject we're in whether it's politics or, or math or science that we're going to say, no, uh, we know everything now and it's defined. It's sort of like, it seems like that gives people a sense of control, uh, but, it, but it, it ends, it, it stifles the actual natural organic growth uh, and development. So, so many things, you know, become clearer as we move further along. And in mathematics, many things became clear, you know, with let's say the foundations of calculus and so forth. Uh, but my point was that by presenting them as all complete and, and set in stone and maybe ignoring the historical context, we kind of make it look different uh, for our students than it could have been. And as a result, it, it maybe is sort of overwhelming. It's a little bit um, too, too academic, too dry, mm -hmm. too, um, you know, final. Here it is, right? And, and it does not reflect, again, the natural development, the historical development of the subject. And it also, I don't think it, it reflects how we learn the subject, truly. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go inside the area and really you know really learn something how do we learn that's another fascinating topic right how do we actually learn anything um my uh, conviction is that we do not learn by passively um digesting information ingesting information mm -hmm. if somebody keeps lecturing and saying things to you and you just go yes 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 um, I do not think learning follows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Because you're you're not you're you're in a sense you're being passive. You're you're but you're it's not actually becoming you're not incorporating it into yourself. You're simply exactly. receiving it and giving it back for it for an exam. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're receiving somebody's wisdom, right? Somebody yeah. 
um, again, it's it's this kind of concept of uh, some higher power, some mm -hmm. some entity giving you this you know divine revelation, and you just have to kind of nod your head and say yes, thank you very much. Yeah, that's not how anyone learns, in my opinion. Well, that's definitely not how I learned mathematics or how I learned anything. Um, I only learn by trying things out and making mistakes, right? Mm. So no, that's a, that's true. I think it's true mm. for everybody. I think it's universally true. We only learn by actually trying things, um, seeing what we can do, and especially when we cannot solve something on the first attempt, right? Mm -hmm. Try, we try to solve a problem, mathematical problem, problem in physics, problem in chemistry, doesn't matter, right? We try to solve some problem and certain things do not work out. And especially when we see maybe two ideas in a seeming, in a, in a seeming contradiction. Yeah. If there is a cognitive dissonance. So I always tell my students, if you encounter two seemingly contradictory things, you're trying to solve a problem, right? You came up with A, you came up with B, and they seem to contradict each other, at least on the surface. And yet you came up with both of them. Yeah. Yet, yeah. yeah. Yet you came up with both of those. This is actually one of the best things that can happen to you. My students obviously don't think so, most of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I keep telling them, look, if you experience a cognitive dissonance like that, um, and, you know, keep calm coming back and forth, going back and forth with, between these two things and trying to resolve this cognitive dissonance. And finally, usually, right, what happens is that there is a novel idea that allows you to see that there is no contradiction. I mean, one possibility you are wrong about A or B. Right. That happens. That happens and that's okay, right? So then if you can find which of these ideas is incorrect, great. Um, but sometimes they are only seemingly in contradiction mm -hmm. and there is actually no contradiction. And that's one of the most amazing things you can, you can discover. And usually there is a third idea that comes to you that allows you to unify these two seemingly contradictory things. Mm -hmm. And again, this applies not just to mathematics, this applies to physics. You know this famous dualism in physics between waves and particles we still don't know right actually the true nature of matter we still do not i mean maybe we'll never know right mm. what is the true nature of um, particles what is the true nature of gravity what is the true nature of light you know we might not know this ever but this idea that maybe you we can think of the same phenomenon as a um, particle and as a mm. wave uh, is not inherently crazy. It yeah, well, actually yeah. works, right? It actually right. works. It works. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, has, so like, yeah. yeah, likewise in mathematics, when you see all these fairly esoteric things, and again, you know, I don't want to trivialize them, all these rates of change that you see for the first time, they're highly non-trivial. Um, so that's that's a little bit of this game. Uh, with infinitesimals, right? So you see something, how should you understand this infinitesimally small? You mm -hmm. can understand this potentially in many ways mm -hmm. and maybe they are not uh, incompatible with each other and that's totally okay. You know, there is a branch of um, logic which is called, I, I wouldn't call it logic, maybe it's called non-standard analysis mm -hmm. where you actually create infinitesimals in the proper sense so you can think of quantities which are not real numbers um, that are really infinitesimal so these are quantities on this kind of border between existence and non-existence right there's something which is non-zero and yet it's smaller than any positive number any positive real number so this this would probably fit very well with your uh, initial question about the difference between 1.000 and 0 0.9999. So yes. in, uh, in non-standard analysis, maybe there is an infinitesimal entity between those two, right? Um, however, I, didn't make it, I did not make it to non-standard analysis. I think that's <laughs> pretty obvious. Yeah. 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 
But in the usual world of real numbers, um, as you know, you can show that these two quantities are the same quantity, which is again, a very non-trivial step because the way one is written usually is just, you know, one point nothing, 1.0. So this is the unit that we, you know, grow up with. We understand natural numbers among the very first things, you know, little kids start counting yeah. one, two, three, four, right? That's the most basic sort of mathematics we, we do. Whereas this 0 0.9999 is an entirely different beast because A, this is a never ending decimal expansion. What does that even mean, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is highly non-trivial again. This has within it, embedded within it is a notion of a limit because basically you're saying, oh, you're taking the limit of this infinite sequence of numbers, which consists of numbers like 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999 and so forth, right? So there is actually a limit coming with that one, uh, you know, never ending sort of decimal expansion. So there is so much going on there that to say, hey, this is actually the same as the number one, not to mention that they're written in a vastly different way. Yeah. Right. Just, just even if you look at what's written on the board, if somebody, you know, if you don't know anything about mathematics at all, you see two symbols or, you know, two strings of symbols that look completely different. Yeah. So then in what sense are they the, sa the same? In what sense do they represent the same quantity? I mean, again, this is not very easy to actually understand at first glance. I wonder, I wonder if, for some, maybe, in my opinion, not as good teachers, uh, that they're, they don't trust perhaps the process of the students actually being able to grapple with contradiction and then, you know, work their way to resolution. Like it, it's, it's sort of by just saying 0 0.999999, dot, 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 you know, equals one, just memorize that, that's right, rather than saying, well, wow, but these look really different seem like really different things. How, how can that be? And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it, it takes agency away from the students. It, take, it, it makes a student not, I mean, the way you're describing it, if you sort of go to the original thinkers of it and you follow through and, and you, accept contra you accept that things that look contradictory really look contradictory, you know, yeah. um, that, that, and then the, as a problem and then try to solve it, you know, it just seems like, that's a way of incorporating mathematics into oneself. It becomes, uh, as you learn it in that way, would seem to be uh, like an organic thing that rather than the, the method of sort of just memorizing and taking on faith and spitting it back out, it seems like something that you can really make your own. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's much more time consuming, obviously, right? Yeah. If you want to engage truly with all these notions and really develop things from scratch. Um, I absolutely believe this is time well spent, mm -hmm. but we typically as instructors uh, don't have the luxury of that time. Mm -hmm. And so I, in a way, you know, I don't blame others that feel like, oh, you know, there's just so little time. I wanna just go quickly through that. But at the end of the day, many students will kind of fall victims of that approach. Unfortunately, this is a typical situation because uh, if they're seeing these things for the first time, these things do need, you know, to be totally digested, right? Processed. And again, processed not passively, but processed actively by trying examples, by looking at the, you know, trying to push the envelope, trying to see, okay, oh, that's a method. That's, you know, usually when you first see it, it looks like a trick. Then you realize, oh, it's a method. You can use it in various instances mm -hmm. and they all play by these rules. How interesting, right? So you wanna, you, you wanna engage in this trial and error. You wanna see how far it goes. You wanna see what generalizes, what doesn't, right? all these different things. So you literally need hours and hours for that. Yeah. And in lecture, we don't have the luxury no. of 
spending you know 10 hours just to motivate the definition of a derivative and that's a pity because it's actually quite nice and it's actually i think extremely edifying not just for the students sometimes even for the instructor you know so when i got to teach some some stuff related to say the history of mathematics uh, and when i teach calculus i try to bring the original writings of mathematicians like like newton we just talked about him um and i try to spend just a little more time motivating th these notions and even that is tricky because some students say you know why are we going on this tangent i yeah. remember getting once a teaching evaluation which said um basically it's all fine but she loves going uh on tangents and i thought which tangents mm -hmm. I brought, uh, yeah, and then I think that students specifically complained about the Newton stuff that I showed mm -hmm. in class. And they said, oh my God, this was going on tangents. So, you know, uh, you can never please everybody, obviously. No. And it's also a good point too. I tend to, since I had such a traumatic experience that I documented in my show uh, as a freshman student in calculus, I, I tend to sort of see the rigidity in the instructor that I had but as you're pointing out, there's also a rigid students, we students, as we're learning, we also have to be open to softening our rigidity to how, how we receive something and, and to, yeah. you know, and to the impatience that yeah. one tends to feel. I mean, looking, if I could go back now, I would love to show this video of this interview with you to my 17 year old self as a freshman. It, it, yeah in college and and because i think it could have made him it could have made a huge difference i don't know whether i i, I don't know what i don't think i would have necessarily gone on to become some great you know field award prize winning something but but this idea that when things didn't make sense when things contradicted when i couldn't work them out initially and my response was to panic and also to feel that that i just well it was my fault Right. Right. And, and right. if just even to have that, if I had had that message that no, like you're saying, even in a really positive way, if you come up with A and you come up with B and they both seem to be true and there's this cognitive dissonance, uh, dissonance that that's a great place to be. That's really exciting. And that's, exactly. you know, and that's what great mathematicians have worked their way through. And so I don't know. I just see to, to, re to replace panic with excitement seems like yeah. a good thing <laughs> generally yeah. speaking yeah i agree with you that some students also come with the expectation that they will be given sort of algorithms right mm. okay to solve problem xyz do this 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 right mm. um and unfortunately mm, what i see in terms of school uh, education high school and middle school and so forth uh, sometimes this approach is very prevalent there mm -hmm. i'm not saying every high school does sure. that if the every teacher does that absolutely not but we do see this quite a lot where students look for again a, an easy sort of procedure to use x, add one to x take one away from y and then exactly. yeah that does exactly. it yeah, yeah. Now give me give me a procedure to solve something and i do understand again where it comes from um sometimes it's the desire to be maybe just quickly done with the problem mm -hmm. sometimes it's a desire for certainty right this mm -hmm. longing for certainty okay i need to know i need to have a certain quick method of doing something uh, i do understand again the kind of it's more comfortable when it's like that however this is also quite boring mm -hmm. and the most interesting problems we encounter in life and the mathematics are not like that right they actually require a creative jump mm -hmm. quantum sort of leap right where we first stare at the problem we see no obvious way to solve it there is no procedure we can think of that we learned in the past nothing comes to mind your adrenaline you know yeah. is jumping through the roof and that's actually the most exciting types of problems for me. And maybe, you know, I'm speaking like that because um, I was a competitive ma mathematician starting very early on. You know, mm -hmm. I was in math Olympiads from the age of seven. 
Yes, so, that, that, that counts as early on, I would say. Yes. That's pretty early, yes. And it's absolutely not for, I'm not saying it's for everyone. Um, you need a certain type of personality. I am a, an uber competitive person. Mm. Uh, even now, you know, on Duolingo and I learn languages, I, I discovered Duolingo in this mm. lockdown time. Yeah. And so needless to say, I, you know, ticked all the boxes there. So I won every single. Uh, mm -hmm. So now you, you, you speak, you speak 50 more languages now than. Uh, no, than no only maybe five more. <laughs> only five. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I did. I did know some of them in the past, so it doesn't count. Anyway, yeah. it was fun um, yeah. and it's competitive. Mm. And I do understand that not everyone is excited by, uh, you know, potential competition. But I think it's fun for lots, lots and lots of uh, students. So mathematics is also uh, if if you participate in math Olympiads and various contests, uh, it becomes very competitive. I think it's fun. I'm not saying everybody needs to do that, but uh, by introducing sort of a healthy degree of competition, I think we can increase the, again, the number of students interested in mathematics, the, the level of interest in mathematics and just the enjoyment of mathematics. So, I uh, wonder if something like this Duolingo app might be actually realizable for math and physics problems and you know maybe different areas of mathematics because it's just so much fun and again doesn't need to be super complicated but I think it could be done at the level where people will just have fun with that and enjoy solving problems. And then you can absolutely have an app, you know, for solving problems. Here's my million dollar idea. Yeah. So, okay, great. And, and I, I'm really busy, so I'm not going to follow up on it. But if, if anyone watching this, any any young person, perhaps, who who's really good at or excited about making apps, make this app and then. Um, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, well, this is, I mean, you're talking about it and you're exemplifying bringing uh, joy, uh, connecting uh, joy, enjoyment, um, and excitement with mathematics. That's, you exude that, you know, that it is that way for you, but you also, to me, you know, communicate it in a way that, you know, I, it's in this conversation just made me feel much more excited about going to original sources and investigating and, and not being investigating how these incredible problems were solved. And, um, and then, you know, not to worry for me in my part, because uh, I'm not going to become a, a mathematician at this point, but, but it, it, to know that for any of us who are interested that it, it's something that this, the, the joy and the organic nature uh, of mathematics is available. It's available. We have the resources for it. Absolutely. Yes. There are lots of good books. So as you know already, I'm a big fan of George Foya mm -hmm. and his work. Foya and Sego are two of my uh, heroes. Mm -hmm. And Foya was a big proponent of the Socratic method of learning mathematics. So he taught his students in, in that way. He wrote several books about it. Uh, his most accessible book is, is called How to Solve It. I think it's extremely accessible even for students just embarking on their college education, you know, first year students. Mm -hmm. um, and then he wrote many other books. I sometimes teach a special class based on his um, two volume book co-written with Gabor Sego. So they were friends and collaborators for years and years. And they wrote a masterpiece, which is called Problems and Theorems in Analysis. Mm -hmm. This is a book I highly recommend for anyone interested in analysis. And it's uh, the entire book is, uh, is, a, is problems, right? So it's a compendium of problems. There is very little theory sort of by way of explanation, mm -hmm. but everything is built through problems. And so you feel um, like you are the creator of those theories because by solving problems, you build the theory, which is absolutely astonishing. Uh, this was very different from any other book at the time. This was a revolutionary 
um, way of writing a math book. They were the very first uh, authors who ever did that. I think since then there have been a number of books, uh, problem books similar to this. But Poya and Segio, absolutely uh, recommended to everybody interested in um, in analysis in calculus, you know. But you know, going beyond calculus. Well, I I, I don't know about any any of the viewers, but I, I'm gonna. I'm going to get those books. <laughs> You've gotten me all excited about them. So yes, yeah. they are. They are. They are amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I I could talk to you for a very, 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 maybe infinitely long time, but I'm I'm uh, I'm quite I'm quite aware that you have you have a quite a busy schedule, and and uh, I'm just really grateful that you took this time uh, to talk well, with me. Fun. So thanks for chatting with me. Yeah, it was fun. I I always enjoy talking with Matt. In a sense, this 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 uh, monologue that I made, the mathematics of change, which is based on an experience that happened to me decades ago, that in a sense, this conversation kind of rescues me from the predicament in which I left myself. <laughs> so in that story. So um, so Olga Holtz, thank you very much. Oh, thank you.